Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Matan Erez. Um, I'm also a professor here, and uh, I have the even greater pleasure of introducing individuals. So um, I don't want to take a lot of time because they have much more interesting things to say than me reading out, you know, 30 awards and things that every one of them got because they're all amazing. So I'll just make it very, very brief. Uh, this is Professor Arvind. He's at MIT. Uh, he has done amazing work in computer architecture, EDA, CAD, programming systems, and just everything related to computer systems. And I'm very interested to hear what he has to say, so I'll just turn over the microphone to him. Thank you. <laughs> How do I wear this? Where's the clip? Oh, I see. How does the clip work? <coughs> Excuse me. Can you just connect this? <laughs> I can't see it. So this very tight. Can you hear me? <clears throat> right. So you know, I first met Yale when uh, he, when he was still at Berkeley, and I don't remember what computer architecture topics we discussed. But all I do remember is for one hour we discussed coffee, right? And <laughs> <laughs> virtues of the coffee he was drinking, and we were both coffee drinkers, so we had great time. But of course, he was always doing great architecture work, which he has done in many, many different institutions. And he's always very inspiring for me, personally, because now when I get on the plane, you know, most people are younger than me. In fact, almost all of them are. But I look at Yale and I say, ah, there is still somebody <laughs> ahead of me. <laughs> all right. So, <clears throat> I'm not a futurist, so I'm not going to predict what will happen in future. So this is really the kind of things I like to work on uh, in future. So one possibility is to work on general purpose microarchitectures. The problem is Yale has done it all, <laughs> right? Whether it's 50-way superscalar or six branch predictors or you name it, right? He's always there and he's been so, so creative in that I'm not sure what is left there to do. And if he forgot to do something, then Guri did it, <laughs> right? So between them, there is no room left, right? So need to find something else to do. All right, so you know, this is a hot topic, multi-cores which are easy to program. Uh, you can't be against that topic. I mean, you know, this is like being against motherhood. The only problem is it would be a good problem to work on provided you have some fresh ideas. Uh, it's a very tough problem, you know, and people keep doing the same thing over and over again and making small changes, and it doesn't make a dent in programming, right? And computer architects have a long history. Every computer architect believes that the machine he has built is the most programmable one. And if you have any doubt about that, ask Bill, you know. <laughs> so <clears throat> he has built, you know, lots of interesting machines. And we always believe that what we are building, what do you mean it's difficult to program? I wrote my matrix multiply, <laughs> which is already a step above, you know, writing vector addition, you know, or something like that on the machine. So uh, we really need new ideas, really, really new ideas. And I think only young people are gonna do this work. I'm not so young anymore. <clears throat> Now, this also, this is another thing we all agree on, that power constraints are the real challenge in front of us. And the fascinating thing is, even though our methodologies for measuring power and our instrumentation for measuring power is extraordinarily poor, we all guess, you know, you read papers and you say, how do you know this? This is some simulator, you know, even though it's off by an order of magnitude, but it tells me something qualitatively. And you say, you've got to be kidding me, right? Things are off by an order of magnitude and they still tell you something meaningful. So uh, in spite of all these weaknesses, the fact remains that functionality of handheld devices is determined primarily by power energy issues. So even though we may not understand in detail where the power is going, but we do know some restrictions, you know, that you can't dissipate more than a certain amount of power, and that ultimately determines what all can be done in these handheld devices. And the other thing we, I think, agree on is there is no better way to reduce power dramatically than to replace compute-intensive software by special-purpose hardware. Because this is the real 
a real sledgehammer. You know, if you could do it, you know, you don't talk of 10% or 20% saving, but you talk in terms of tenfold, hundredfold, maybe even thousandfold savings in power. So specialization is one way of doing this. <clears throat> and you know, the living proof of this is smartphones. I mean, it's amazing to me, you know, what has happened to these devices over the last uh, decade or more. And if you look at such a thing, you know, a general purpose core, you know, we hardly talk about it, whether it's ARM or Intel, well, it's never Intel, you know, or whatever, right? <laughs> uh, in these devices, what we talk about is, um, you know, what surrounds it. There may be as many as 70, 80 blocks, uh, which are very complex in these things. And what matters is the total functionality of the system. And any time you can say power on an important application, that means you're enabling something else, something else that can be done. So really, it wasn't a given at all that you'll be able to watch high definition movies on your smartphone, but now you all take it for granted. And that will just not be possible without lots of special purpose hardware. The same thing is true, of course, of wireless. You know, I mean, uh, a handheld device is of little use without uh, very powerful communication aspects to it, and communication consumes a lot of power. So there is so much specialization in it, both at the protocol level and the hardware level, that uh, people would like to just bring down that power to as little as possible. So this is a living example of something where we have to worry about the total system. And if you are an Intel executive trying to sell the slot in this thing, it's really a very, very small potatoes. It's the whole picture that matters in this game. Power consumption less than one watt. Why do we pay attention to it? Because regardless of how complex it is, the power is fixed. You cannot dissipate more than three, four watts uh, for a long periods. Otherwise, you won't be able to hold your phone in your hand. So this is a biological limit. It's not the case that five years from now, people will have different hands, and they'll be able to hold a 30-watt device in their hand. That's not in the cards. you know. So this limit is forever, right? Uh, and we have to pay attention to it. Now, a design of systems embodying special purpose hardware presents its own challenges. So what are these challenges? Uh, so for example, software stack has to run on ever-changing special purpose hardware. See, our view of special purpose hardware used to be that there is so much hardware and this much software on it. That has completely changed. I mean, even I had a hard time believing in 2003, 2004, when people said, you know, we'll be running the whole software stack on smartphones. I mean, it just didn't seem, you know, really, come on, you know. And that's exactly where we are. You know, people want everything on their smart devices, you know. So software stack has to run on ever-changing special hardware. And this is very, very different from the PC situation, right? Where in 1980, IBM defined the interface, and then we could all innovate on different sides of the boundary. No longer true. Right, because the hardware is going to be changing and that interface has to be defined differently. Exact hardware software decomposition is often not clear until one, in the, one is into deep design phase of it. And often things move, you know, things we used to do in hardware, we start doing in software and vice versa. So there has to be some fluidity as to how we deal with these things. Uh, functional verification of these things is a nightmare. What does it mean to be functionally correct? For example, you know, uh, when your screen turns off, if the phone call also turned off, you'll be really mad, right? Is that functional verification? So we are into new era of functional verification, you know, when you start taking power issues into account in this. And uh, furthermore, to design these things properly, uh, we don't know the answer up front. You know, we really have to explore the design space. So, you know, so power performance exploration is essential to do things right. So we need a design methodology where specs are agnostic to hardware software implementations. Blocks can be composed in parallel to form bigger blocks. I'm not the one who believes that these problems will be solved top down. Okay, I think somebody's gonna come to you and say, I have a wonderful GPS unit, right? I have a wonderful radio, I have a wonderful this and that. And really it's a question of how do we put all these things together to build a great device. So uh, parallel composition with proper semantics is the, at the heart of the matter in this. Tools for designing blocks can be domain specific. 
I, I would go a step further. Not only they can be domain specific, they have to be domain specific. There is no general purpose recipe that is going to take care of all sorts of accelerators we want to build and all, all sorts of programming we want to do on them. Specs and implementations can continually evolve. You know, it's not a good enough answer to say, well, they changed the specs on me. I mean, that's part of the spec that is going to change because I can only specify so much, right, until I see the results. And if I don't like that, right, you must have done to your architect, right? You halfway the, say, yeah, is this what I asked for? No, this is not what I want. So changing specs is just for various reasons is an essential part of the game, and we have to worry about flexible design, how to deal with this. Modular refinement has to be supported, that if I want to change one module, should not require me to understand everything about the design, right? I should just be able to worry about this module and perhaps a few things it talks to. So how to do this black box refinement where I can take out some piece and plop in a better piece is a very, very important part of this new methodology. So new style rapid prototyping, so obviously there is need for it, supporting a functionality in special purpose hardware can save tons of energy, right? It's both necessary and possible to model large parts of complex systems involving special purpose hardware to determine feasibility, performance, and design trade-offs. And prototyping, you know, this is a common refrain you hear, prototyping will increase time to market. Uh, I do not believe that for a second. If done properly, right, uh, it does not have to increase the time to market at all because these designs should be able to go into production uh, with uh, 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 very great ease, if done right. Now, what is the unsolved problem in this? So even if you know we learn how to design these things properly, uh, there is this problem of you know when you design a chip, there is a lot of upfront costs, you know, NREs uh, in this, and uh, <clears throat> it's not clear to me. This is beyond my expertise, you know. So this is getting into technology issue and perhaps 3D stacking. Uh, will show us a way, you know, so that we can make small changes in chips without, you know, blowing the whole budget and, and, and not having, right now you make small changes in the chip and, you know, the NRE is exactly the same, right, as if you change the whole chip. So this is a very big problem and I don't have an answer to this, right? Maybe a new kind of reconfigurable architecture will emerge, right? So quite a few people are thinking about this, you know, that they understand the inefficiency of FPGAs can we do something differently? Can we do something differently which dramatically improves the efficiency of FPGAs with respect to ASICs or something like that? And I like the work James Ho is uh, doing in this area at, at Carnegie Mellon. The future. I think architecture research community has to dramatically expand its scope, not just microarchitectures, but all the software issues related to hardware software design. Systems are getting too complex to be designed in an ad hoc manner. Uh, need a more formal, uh, you know, more formal approach, more formal tool, so that the composition of things works in a predictable way. End of Moore's law will probably create more jobs for architects, you know, because now you'll have a fixed budget, and instead of moaning about it, you say, "Show me what you can do with this," right? So I actually feel that it, it'll push specialization even more. Uh, if, if things slow down and you didn't keep, you know, getting things smaller and better all the time. Okay, so this is my final message. Simulation is passe. All future systems require FPGA prototyping, so no more pictures like this, but more like this. All right, I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs> Very early in the morning. <laughs> Any comments? One over there. Oh, sorry. Yes? Uh, sorry, say that again. Uh, I agree, but you know, we don't write software in vacuum. I mean, we have some idea of the underlying substrate. It may be very, very abstract, but we have to have a cost model of doing things. And, and the point in specialization is essentially you are taking away layers of interpretation, which in some sense is just mere overhead.
Yes. No, no problem with that. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Are, actually, are we actually training engineers to have a good understanding of both? Ah. <laughs> So education is yet another very, very big topic in this. I think the education is defective in this area. So even though we train very good people in software and very good people in hardware, you know, there are, in my opinion, there are too many silos. And I would like it to be very, very fluid, you know, because I don't want to hear from a student, you know, that, oh, you're talking of clocks, I'm a software guy, right? <laughs> and so, <clears throat> all right. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs>